All right, today we need to look at the church in medieval Europe. Uh, and the reason we need to is we'll find that the church is one of those key institutions that really marks the um, Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, those three institutions are chivalry, feudalism, and the church. So we need to see why the church is going to play such an important role. Um, if you'll remember, the Franks converted to Christianity after Clovis did, uh, the first king. And when Clovis converted, first his nobles will convert because it makes sense for the nobles to have the same religion as their ruler. And soon after, the other Frankish people convert. And especially after Charlemagne became the Roman emperor, um, he spread Christianity to the rest of the Germanic people in Western Europe. And so we'll see the church grow. And remember, the church we're talking about here is the one out of Rome. So this is what we call the Catholic Church, uh, as opposed to the Orthodox Christians from Constantinople. Now, the split hasn't happened um, at this point we're talking about, but they're starting to look more and more different. Um, one version or um, practice we see in Catholic Christianity in the early Middle Ages is monasticism. Monasticism means living like a monk. Um, monks are people who separate themselves from society, they're strictly disciplined, and they do so for uh, religious purposes. We've seen monks in Buddhism, um, but we're going to see it play an important role in Christianity as well. The first monks typically lived by themselves. Uh, they were hermits. They'd live out maybe in a cave or by themselves in the woods or some other place so they could isolate themselves from society and focus on their religion. But one monk is going to change that is named Benedict. And Benedict thought that it would be a good idea if monks lived together and followed the same set of rules. He thought maybe that would kind of give them more um, discipline and more reliance on each other. Uh, so Benedict sat down and wrote a set of rules. Uh, it's known as Benedict's Rule. And there's a whole lot of detailed things in there. They kind of order what a monk should do every day, when he should get up, when he should pray, uh, what he should do afterwards. Um, and that set of rules is going to be adopted by a lot of the monks in Europe. And they start an order or a group of monks called the Benedictine Order. Uh, and the basic rule that Benedict established was monks should work and pray. And that's what they did in these monasteries, places where monks lived. Um, so monasteries became really important religious centers in Europe. Um, first of all, they were where the monks lived. So that's where most of the monks were until we start to see other kinds of monks later. Um, they are going to be centers of religion in that they will help spread religion outward. Uh, and also, one important thing to note, you know, we discussed how Germanic people, for the most part, weren't literate. Well, monks were. So monks are also going to be a source of education. Um, you won't see widespread education outside of monasteries yet, but eventually some of these monasteries are actually going to turn into uh, colleges. Uh, and universities. Um, another important thing that monks did was copy books. So before you had the printing press, all books had to be copied by hand. Um, and monks who needed to have things like the Bible and other religious books did a lot of that copying. Um, and aside from religious texts, they also are going to save some ancient Greek and Roman texts. Um, so a lot of what we know about that period actually came from medieval books that were copied. Uh, you can see some examples here of a uh, medieval Bible. So in this one, um, you can see everything is handwritten. Uh, you kind of see too, there's these lines, um, kind of like you might see on a, on a piece of notebook paper. Um, so the monks had to write all this out. Um, all of it's in Latin, too. Latin was the language of educated people. And you can also see these, uh, these illustrations. These, these uh, kind of manuscripts are called illuminated manuscript um, because they have these pictures that sort of draw attention to, um, to the text. So you can see in this one, you've got um, a large letter P. And that's, you see this sometimes in, um, in magazines and newspapers, too. It's called a drop cap. It was invented by these medieval monks. Uh, and in, within the letter P is a picture of St. Peter. Um, so it was both a letter and also sort of a form of art. Uh, you can also see a really detailed one here on the left. This is from an Irish 
manuscript called the Book of Kells. Um, that's from the, uh, a page that had the start of the Gospel of Matthew. And then on the right is another drop cap. So this one's a large letter U. Uh, and you can see inside is a picture of Jesus um, with some monks and some nobles. Um, so they're kind of drawing in some views of medieval society too. Also, you can see they actually use gold in creating this. Um, that shiny background is that gold leaf that's pressed onto the paper. Um, the structure of the Catholic Church, um, which was the same structure as the medieval church, was that you had the head of the church as the Pope. Uh, the Pope's official title was Bishop of Rome. Um, and he was seen as successor of St. Peter, um, one of the original apostles, kind of the leader of the apostles. Um, beneath the Pope, and including the Pope, are people called clergy. Clergy just means church officials. These are people who have jobs separate from the rest of people in the church. Beneath the Pope, you have other bishops. These bishops act as regional authorities, and they're going to lead large um, groups of churches. And individual churches or parishes are led by priests and sometimes monks um, who are going to run their own monasteries as well. Um, one of the key things that the church provides for people are what we call sacraments. Um, a sacrament in Catholic Christianity are rituals that are believed to transmit grace to believers. And Christians believe these were necessary for salvation. In other words, uh, if you don't get sacraments from the church, you wouldn't go to heaven. And one thing to remember about the Germanic people, um, even more so than Romans, is they were very, very religious, even to the point of superstition. So the church is going to play a really important role in their lives. Uh, they want to make sure they can receive the sacraments, um, like baptism, communion, confession. Uh, they want to be able to receive these regularly. And to do that, they have to be in good standing with the church. So church is going to play a really important role for your average uh, medieval Christian. Uh, one important role we see the church play is in the creation of the Holy Roman Empire. We already talked about how Charlemagne was crowned Emperor of the Romans by the Pope. Um, and after the Carolingian Empire fell, uh, you see it sort of revive under a German king named Otto I. And Otto actually got his power by making an alliance with the church. Um, and after he allied with the church and the church gave him approval, he's going to defeat the other princes in Germany. And then in 962, um, he's crowned uh, emperor, the same title that Charlemagne had. And we're going to see the church and the Holy Roman Empire, this new empire that Otto started, um, rely on each other for support. Um, we're going to see the, the Holy Roman Empire be around actually until the 19th century. Um, but kind of its heyday, the period when it's most influential, is from um, about 900 here to about 1200. Um, you start to see the empire change under the reign of Frederick. Um, Frederick became emperor in 1155, and he wanted to expand his territory, so he went and invaded northern Italy. Um, as he was gone, the other princes in Germany who decided they wanted their own independence are going to revolt against him. So Frederick has to turn around and go and put down this rebellion from these other nobles. And at the same time, he is going to lose territory in Italy. So you see that the Holy Roman Empire shrink. And his successor, Frederick II, um, is going to have to rely on these princes, these same princes who rebelled, to help him keep power. Um, so after Frederick I, the position of emperor is actually elected which is kind of unusual, um, you might think, for, a, for an emperor. And this is going to be kind of a characteristic of the Holy Roman Empire, is the emperors are elected by these prince electors. Um, what's all this have to do with the church? We're going to start to see conflict between the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. And some of it starts under a pope named Gregory. Uh, Gregory was a monk before he was pope. And as a monk, he lived a pretty disciplined life, praying, working, uh, not owning kind of any property. And as a very disciplined um, person, he also kind of brings that discipline into the church and this authority into the church. So when he becomes pope, he starts to expand the influence of uh, the office of the pope into more secular 
for non-religious matters. So he's going to start trying to influence how kings rule, um, how alliances work, wars between these different Germanic kingdoms. Uh, and that's going to bring the role of the, the church even more to the forefront. Um, one thing that develops out of the church is the idea of canon law. Canon law are laws that the church enforces. Um, and what was really key, or at least as a tool for the church to use, was um, excommunication. Excommunication means to be excluded from the sacraments. And as we talked about just a few minutes ago, um, being excluded from the sacraments means you don't get to go to heaven. So for the very religious Germanic people, that's an important thing. Now, you're not going to see your average you know, Germanic peasant be excommunicated. But if you have, say, a ruler or a king who doesn't do uh, what the pope thinks is right or what the church thinks is right, they could be excommunicated. And by excluding them from the sacraments, that can make the ruler look bad. Now, let's say you excommunicate a ruler and he doesn't make any changes. Well, then a larger punishment could be an interdict. In an interdict, an entire region is excluded from the sacraments. So a, the pope might put an, uh, an interdict on a kingdom if uh, the king isn't listening to him, and then no one in the entire kingdom can receive sacraments. Well, then you can imagine the people in the kingdom would not be very happy, and they might try to overthrow their king. Um, so the church's influence could be really powerful with the, with the canon law, with the punishments involved there. And the particular conflict that the Holy Roman Empire is going to come into conflict with the church is something called lay investiture. Um, in lay investiture, secular or non-religious rulers got to choose bishops. Um, now, bishops in the Middle Ages are going to be not only church officials, they're also going to sort of act as nobles. They have a lot of land, they have a lot of authority, uh, and often a lot of wealth. And so a lot of kings feel like because they're getting land, and because they are going to act as sort of a part of the nobility, rulers should get to choose the bishops. And the church countered that bishops were members of the clergy, uh, and they were under the domain of the pope, so the church should be the one to choose the bishops. So there starts to be this sort of conflict um, between the church and rulers, especially Holy Roman emperors, over lay investiture. Um, at one point, the pope will actually excommunicate um, one of the Holy Roman emperors um, who insisted on lay investiture. Um, eventually, they came to an agreement in 1122 called the Concordia de Worms. And um, the agreement was that the church would appoint the bishops, but the emperor could veto them. And this relationship between the church and the state is going to go back and forth throughout the Middle Ages. You're going to see that as kind of a characteristic of religion and, and politics um, throughout history. Getting into the 900s. Um, we start to see some problems develop in the church, and this is going to lead to some major reforms. Um, the three big problems. One was bishops marrying. Um, since about eh, 500 or so, um, priests were not allowed to marry. Uh, it was considered discipline in the church. Um, but bishops who, remember, had a lot of wealth, um, started to marry or sometimes just have children in secret. And often they'd have a hand in choosing their successors. And naturally, they start to choose their own children. And this leads to sort of these dynasties in, in bishops that um, the church saw as a major problem. The other problem was a practice called simony. That's selling church positions. Uh, so bishops might want to uh, sell, the say, the position of a priest in a very high-profile or, or wealthy church um, so that they can make themselves wealthier. This was obviously a major problem for the church as well. And then lay investiture is a problem that's going to pop up again and again across Western Europe. Um, so you see a lot of problems in, in Western Europe with the church. Um, and with those, you're going to start to see reforms. Um, one is the development of new religious orders. So thus far, we've kind of only talked about the, uh, the Benedictine order, or the order of St. Benedict. Um, these monks who lived in monasteries, prayed, copied books, that kind of thing. Um, one new religious order is going to come out of Italy, and uh, it's started by a name named Francis of Assisi. Francis was a very wealthy merchant who eventually decided that uh, God was calling him to uh, live as a monk, but not a monk in a monastery, um, but instead a poor traveling monk. 
these kind of monks we're going to call friars. It comes from the Latin word frater, which means brother. Um, and Francis sort of starts this movement that eventually becomes a formal religious order called the Franciscan order. And Franciscan priests or friars, rather than living in monasteries, are going to go uh, travel from town to town, preaching and trying to convert people. And this sort of brings a revival of, um, of discipline and this idea that poverty in the church is good. Um, one other thing the church does is to establish the formation of church courts. So they already had canon law, but there wasn't necessarily a formal way to process people who broke canon law. With church courts, now the church could bring bishops and priests who uh, went against the church's practices um, and, and try them to actually you know, get evidence and uh, have a formal process to prosecute them. Um, so bishops might be removed from their positions or priests might be um, excommunicated in some cases. But this is going to bring more discipline to the church. And then you also see the construction of um, new cathedrals um, in churches. And the style they're going to use is called the Gothic architecture. It's named after the Goths uh, that we saw in Vague Rome because it's going to come out of that region. But it's a new style of architecture that is going to be uh, kind of characteristic of churches in the late Middle Ages. Um, so before we see Gothic churches, um, you have what's called Romanesque churches. This style actually goes back to ancient Rome. And you see some examples here. Um, Romanesque churches tend to be kind of boxy, um, kind of narrow, and uh, not a lot of natural light. So you can see on the left there, um, very small windows. On the right, the churches tend to be kind of dark, cramped. Um, but with new forms of architecture, we start to see these very um, more elaborate and um, taller churches in the Gothic style. So here's a good example of a Gothic church called um, the Kulnerdam or the Cathedral of Cologne. Um, you can see very tall spires, lots of arches, very tall windows. Um, all this is sort of the idea is it elevates the eye and the mind to God and religious ideas. Uh, and here's the inside of a Gothic church in um, Paris uh, called La Saint Chapelle. And uh, this one has a really good illustration of both these really tall windows, mostly made of stained glass. Um, and, and remember, people in the Middle Ages, for the most part, couldn't read. So a lot of what they learned actually came from looking at the stained glass. It would be pictures of um, religious practices or stories from the Bible or other things on there. You will also see at the top of this picture this uh, characteristic called the, the um, barrel vault. They basically take an arch and then put an arch across it and then um, copy that pattern. And that makes this big sort of um, stretched out arch that can make a much taller, um, more open architecture. Uh, another important architecture feature of the um, Gothic style was the flying buttress. So one problem, the reason Romanesque churches had such small windows is you make them too big and the walls fall down. Uh, and that's because of the weight of the roof and the walls. But they figured out that a lot of the weight was being pushed outward, not downward. And you could add these um, supports called flying buttresses. They're just sort of attached to pillars on the outside of the building. Uh, and this allowed for much taller structures and larger windows. Um, so you see this is one from actually Notre Dame in Paris. Um, and that's a characteristic of a lot of Gothic architecture. And here's another example from uh, Norway. Um, again, you can see very tall spires, lots of windows, uh, and lots of these pointed arches. Uh, we're going to continue to see the church play a really important role, um, but keep all that in mind, and then next time we're going to look at uh, feudalism and chivalry, the other two major institutions in the Middle Ages.